Thank you. Good evening to everybody. I just want to give you a perspective, um, the perspective from which I will describe the Mario Negri Institute and discuss with you the values of the Institute. I have a degree in philosophy and a background in scientific journalism. And I'm a researcher in the Laboratory of Research on Consumer Involvement at the Mario Negri Institute since 2003. So I have no financial conflict or interest in relation with the contents of this presentation, but I have some intellectual conflict of interest working at the Mario Negri Institute since many years. Uh, the Mario Negri Institute has uh, three sites in Italy, one in Milan and two in Bergamo, and you were in Milan, Lisa, and uh, I work there. And uh, we have 10 departments. I don't uh, go through the details of this department, but just to uh, provide an overview of the many research fields we deal with. About 700 people are working at the Mario Negri Institute. And then why was the Mario Negri founded? Well, it was founded by Silvio Garattini in 1963. Silvio Garantini was an assistant in the Faculty of Pharmacology at the University of Milan. And he came to the United States to spend some time in several research institutes. He came back to Milan and decided to bring the model of uh, institutes uh, that he saw in, uh, in Italy. So thanks to a uh, jovial uh, philanthropist, Mario Negri, the, um, that decided to to found the institute, the Institute uh, Bern. And uh, it was uh, along the time sustained by several other philanthropists, but uh, it was funded as a private not-for-profit institute. So the decision was to make an institute flexible, also in terms of administrative burden, um, but not for profit, so uh, in the public interest. It, at that time, it was uh, the 60s in Italy, it was the only foundation that was mm, completely dedicated to research. So there were other groups doing research, of course, at the university, in the hospital, some of them, but the only institute internally dedica dedicated to scientific research was the Mario Negri Institute. And it, this was uh, uh, the, uh, the vision of Silvio Garattini. We work in three main fields, and these are quite common nowadays, uh, um, fields of uh, activities of many research institutes, but at that time it was not so common to have these fields of activities or so research, education and training, communication and dissemination. And uh, we do research from bedside to bench and back, as we usually say, and so we start from patient needs, and uh, because we have many collaboration with hospitals and clinicians, so then come back to bench and then do uh, again uh, back to the healthcare assistance. And we also do research on um, information and communication activities. And these are the areas where I'm involved in. And so research on how to communicate and disseminate study findings and healthcare information. And as I said, we also have many courses. Uh, you can see here are some of the courses we provide to researchers and to students. We also have uh, summer students coming uh, in the Institute uh, every year, except the last one, because it was not possible to come to the Institute. They are secondary school uh, students, uh, spending some time with the researchers. We also have some informal um, uh, training. We say we call them Club de les Due. Lisa came and um, give, gave us a seminar and it was uh, um, a common habit for the research in Marine Grisium to do internal seminars provide and uh, presenting their uh, findings and their studying uh, and, and this is an occasion to debate and to discuss about the research question, the study design and also about the findings of uh, every research presenting uh, her results and also an occasion to collaborate with other research group and to know what other research group at the Marine Negri are doing because we are many people and many, many people and many research fields. We have also some services of information on drugs. So some colleagues provide information related to the health of elderly or rare diseases, mother and child health, 
by phone or by mail. And we also have uh, this application for uh, health professionals on drug interactions that is completely different. Uh, and uh, so we developed this kind of application and we provided this to health professionals. And um, I, 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 I like to, to describe you and to, to introduce you this project, which, which is called Partecipa Salute, Partecipa Salute Project. It was the project on which I started to work at the Marinegri Institute. The aim is to provide, uh, to create an alliance among scientific societies, health professional and patient groups. And so we developed uh, several projects within this kind of broad uh, project. And in particular, we developed some critical appraisal tools to critical appraisal health information on the press, on the websites, and also regarding awareness campaign aimed at the public. Uh, we also just make a list of these are very common activities among researchers and other research institutes, but we, we write lay articles and uh, post, of course, make posts on social media. We participate and organize public events and also participate in meetings with students, sometimes uh, uh, talking about our research findings, sometimes answering to their questions. So, these are our funding. These are, uh, this slide is related to the 2018. So we can say that uh, a third of uh, our funds uh, come from private companies, a third uh, come from donations, and a third uh, um, comes from calls and grants. No single source exceeds uh, the 10% of the annual budget. These are our core values. So, uh, Silvio Gattini founded the Marinegri and has been the director of the Marinegri since many years, but recently he, he became the president of the Marinegri. The new director is Professor Giuseppe Remuzzi. And when he, Silvio Gattini made uh, his last talk as director, he started talking about the passion for research and talking about the need uh, to, to, be, to have passion for, uh, for research, to do the work, uh, um, to do this kind of work. I think that is uh, something useful for every kind of work, but especially for this kind of, of work, it's very important to focus on uh, research and to go on uh, doing research. And also to have this kind of approach to things that is a questioning approach uh, common to many researchers. We, did not, we do not patent uh, our findings or discoveries, and the other, our core values are independence, transparency, and the research considered as a part of healthcare assistance. So the support and the, um, the support of a national health service. No patents, why, why we decided not to patent, uh, to be free mainly, I just list here the many reasons why the Mayanegri Institute decides not to patent its findings, so to be free from conflict of interest, to be free to criticize. Uh, if you say uh, the sale of the drugs uh, involves royalties, and so you are, uh, um, maybe the risk is to maximize the benefits related to the drug you are developing to your discovery. Also to be free to communicate uh, because uh, patent requires confidentiality and we think that biomedical research should be open and transparent. To collaborate with different network uh, without uh, collaboration that uh, could conceal the potential interest to use the, the ideas of others. And uh, finally, to choose the direction of the research and to choose the areas of research. And the independence. So, um, these are very broad value, but uh, then I will go through the detail of, of how some example uh, on how the Institute apply these kind of uh, values. We mean independence uh, within the, a dialogue and collaboration with many stakeholders and also with pharmaceutical industries. We strict attention to uh, the relevance of research questions, the methodology, the transparency of choices made during the development of studies and uh, during the development of a research field. The ownership of data till publication, 
when is, it is the case, the publication of our results, both positive and negative. And here we, I, I would like to, pro to give you an example. Um, some years ago, the Institute was involved in a European project under the framework of a private uh, public scheme. It was an innovative medicine initiative project. So we have also commercial partners. The commercial partner, uh, it, it was a, a big network of institutes of research. The commercial partner wanted to decide which kind of data and results and findings to publish and when, and to whom share the data with. And so finally, uh, the Mario Negri Institute, the director, Silvio Garattini, and the research group involved in this project decided to withdraw from this project. So we decided to withdraw from the project and we lost a, a considerable amount of money. So it was not an easy choice, but uh, at the, we thought that it was not acceptable for us, for us that deal. So we decided to, to withdraw from that. So transparency is a very huge concept, meaning many, many um, decisions and many other facts, but uh, it means to be accountable and reliable um, in relation to the research that we do. And so these are only some points related to transparency. The need to, to register the study protocols, to publish the results, as, as I just said, to share the data with other researchers. And another point is a communication to the public. I again um, talk about communication because uh, one of the mission of the Institute is to communicate to the public not the results. Mm, first, because people and patients are involved and we do research, clinical research involving patients. So we have to communicate the findings to the patient, but also because uh, we are sustained by some uh, donations. And also because uh, the research is in close, uh, of course, a relation with society. And so we think that it is uh, not uh, a secondary activity, but is uh, strictly related to do research, the communication, the public communication, not only of the findings, but also of the research field, of research question of why you decide to um, research one area and not the other. And these are the example I provided before with the, the Partecipa Salute, Salute project is just one example. We took part also in international project, a European project dealing with the awareness of European citizens on clinical research, developing some tools, an animated film aimed at the, the European citizen on clinical research and the methodology of uh, clinical research, which is called the, the ECRAM project. So, um, just to provide some example. And here is another point very important for the Institute that research is an expression of care. So when you don't know uh, what to do in healthcare assistant, because there is uncertainty, you have to do research as a part of your healthcare assistant uh, to know which treatment is best and to know what to do. And uh, on the other side, research has to be conducted uh, according to the needs uh, um, of a patient and of clinicians. So research nested in clinical practice is uh, uh, a very important way uh, to uh, practice research and is uh, related to the model of the Maria Negri Institute. And we have some example, historical example in the cardiological fields. The first uh, big trials, multi-center trials in Italy were done uh, coordinated by the Mario Negri Institute, and they were nested in clinical practice and cardiology. Uh, we also have networks of, with clinicians in oncology, uh, in renal, for renal diseases, in rare diseases. So we collaborate um, with uh, many networks of clinicians. To avoid the waste of research and resources, so this is another point. Uh, so to, to support only the um, intervention and treatments that uh, um, are uh, sustained by uh, evidence of their efficacy and safety, and to answer two questions that are relevant for the public health and healthcare assistance again. We also uh, are involved in the Choosing Wisely movement, uh, and so we think it is uh, 
very important to sustain also this uh, value. Values in practice, just to provide uh, an overview of requirements of requirements for the clinical study done at the Mario Negri Institute. The Mario Negri Institute can have different roles uh, when doing research, so it can be the sponsor, a partner, uh, collaborating a network, uh, and a different source of funding, as I said before. Any clinical study uh, must comply with this requirement. So the clinical relevance for patients and public health, I just said that the rationale for the study include that the choice of experimental intervention and the comparator have to be informed by a review of the literature and data and relevant clinical and preclinical data, meaning that the study hypothesis addresses an open question the, uh, that there is a a real uncertainty on the questions to be answered, that, because this is on, the only way to justify the involvement of uh, patients and the randomization of patients. And also the rules for transparency, here you can see uh, a list that I've already presented you, the commitment to enter the trial in a public register before inclusion of the first participant, the commitment to post trial results in a public register one year after the trial is completed, and so also to publish results irrespective of findings and of course a declaration of conflict of interest. There are also, uh, just to, to go for, uh, through these, there are also some um, requirements related to the methods because these are very broad uh, values, but they mean, um, they mean very concrete uh, choices also in terms of the methodological development of a study. So the, the decision of the research question or the comparator or the sample size, the importance to provide a clear informed consent to patients, the importance to try to involve patient groups in defining the protocol of a study, for example. And so I mean that these are very broad values, but in practice, they mean very concrete choices also for the development the uh, uh, clinical study, but also in providing information and communication. But now I would like to, to, to discuss or debate with you or present you some points that with some colleagues uh, we debate uh, at the Mario Negri Institute. So here I present you some of these broad uh, the, um, perspectives and uh, as uh, elements that are one uh, opposite to the other. This is not always the case, but uh, the Mario Negri Institute has a, a broad vision of healthcare and research within healthcare could be considered opposite to the increasing boosting of specialization in research. Also the wide range of research areas, we deal with oncology, with public health, with um, environmental sciences, renal diseases, and so on. We do preclinical research and also clinical research, and research of information and communication. So, we have a wide range of uh, fields and, and uh, kind of research, but this could be considered opposite to the increasing uh, required for competitiveness that could require to be very focused in terms of people, research ideas to specific areas. Uh, the independence as uh, I presented you before, um, it is uh, opposite to vested interest, but the um, question of interest in research is very complex. Uh, the question of conflict of interest is very broad. We, mean on, uh, we intend also to discuss about not only conflict and economic, uh, uh, sorry, financial and economic conflict of interest, uh, which are very important uh, and have very important consequences on research and research findings, but for example, also on intellectual academic conflict of interest. So we decided not to patent discoveries of, or research findings, how we can handle this with the increasing demand for innovation and with the assessment of research impact also in terms of patent, for example, or with the need of personal rewards of people working on a specific area for many, many years. And then at the end of their activity, if they discover something, they cannot patent it at the Marine Green Institute. So these are huge questions. Some of them I think are not uh, as I try to, to 
to provide um, an idea in the title, conciliation, dialectic, confrontation, or replacement. I think some of these points are not, uh, um, it's not possible to conciliate some of these points, but maybe, maybe other, we should talk about how we can consider this broad range of values, so considering the complexity of the situation regarding research, the integrity of research, and also the assessment of research and of a research institute. Uh, such as Marine Agri Institute. And so how to renew core values and share them with young researchers, because uh, we, I think we cannot take these uh, values for granted because of a long-standing history, expertise and practice of the Marine Agri Institute and of the person working at the Marine Agri Institute, uh, both because uh, uh, some uh, the people change, some people are changed, some, and so uh, the research that at the very beginning or in the 80s, in the 90s, made the Marine Green Institute are not the same. Some are still present, but some not. And uh, also because the young researchers so, uh, did not share this kind of expertise and experience. So how we can share these values or translate or uh, debate these values with people that uh, do not uh, um, participate in the history of the Marine Negri, of the Marine Negri. And just to, I say the Marine Negri because it's, it's the example that I know, but I think that it is a question also for other research institutes. And also what needs to be done to to sustain these core values, it is still possible to sustain these values, so considering the complexity of research, considering the lack of funding, considering the approach of private, uh, public private uh, paradigm. And, uh, and so um, the issues of integrity of research, how to assess the quality of research, and how to maintain this kind of uh, um, institute is possible, not only in terms of resources and funding, but also in terms of people making the Marion Agri Institute. I think that we should uh, um, we should think about um, um, spaces and time to critically reflect on the research we do. And but this is not so easy because uh, we can consider that the young researchers, for example, have to, uh, to train themselves uh, to apprise the skills, uh, to apply to, for research grants, uh, and to do so in very strict time. A research project lasts two or three years. You have to do many things, and they are very scheduled. And you don't always have the time to debate some issues coming from your research with other colleagues and also to, to debate them, not only for a specific problem that you can, of course, discuss and debate with, with your research group, but um, also according to this broad vision. And I think that it is not so easy also considering that some young researchers uh, live a precarious uh, working condition and also a precarious uh, living condition. So we should consider that society is complex and that researchers are citizens and are in society. So how should we consider the future of, uh, of an institute like Mario Negri um, in this per perspective? Uh, we, we, we debate with some colleagues around these uh, topics and we are trying, so some of course, some initiatives are still uh, um, we still have some initiative for this, but it's, I think it's not so easy to maintain this kind of ident identity of, uh, of institutes. So this is my final uh, slide, and I would like also to, to listen to your, um, to your opinions on, 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 on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, I would appreciate if you stop the yes. sharing. Yes, and we can go into the gallery mode so you see everything. Okay, okay. Excellent. So now, if you could turn your cameras on, that will be great. Um, all right, Rita, great to see you. Can so you see me? Yes. yes. Thank you so much um, for Hi, Rita. a wonderful talk. And um, Lots of issues. I think very interesting to hear from John, who was involved in IMI initiative and what experience did you have? Because that's quite a move from 
Um, Mario Negri, a very important president, very few people would be able to do something like that. And um, I guess a more, um, a wider call because um, we had this discussion with Lydia and with Jack, um, how, how do we deal with public funds? So who wants to start? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Lydia, go ahead. Yeah, I must say it's very recognizable uh, what you just told. We are, I don't know if you know the Anti-Cancer Fund, we are also an independent research foundation, much, much smaller than you are. But let's say we have the same core values, but we are focused really on, on oncology. And actually, uh, uh, I was lucky also to meet with uh, Silvio Garattini because he once came to the European Parliament uh, to be on our panel when we were organizing a round table on uh, drug repurposing. So yeah, what our idea is that we should really try to, to collaborate uh, amongst foundations because our idea is that being small, but being scientists, we, we should try to, to partner with bigger foundations who are very strong in, in fundraising and uh, but don't have the science in house and they always rely on acad on academics then and of course the academics have a different agenda i think from uh, honestly from public uh, uh, research well from research foundations like ours because we want to serve the public in the first place and academic researchers with all due respect they have other KPIs they need to publish, they, do, they need to do a different type of research. They pre yeah, we are also only focused on, mainly focused on clinical research, but a lot of research in academics is focused on, on the preclinicals because that delivers much more uh, publications, of course. One clinical trial can last for five years and, and it will give you one publication. So that, that's the, the real complexity of the system. And uh, yeah, we try to, to, to set up the, those collaborations to, to offer our, let's say, science skills to other foundations uh, and to then uh, uh, together select the, the right products that are in line with, with what I would say the unmet needs, uh, what is really patient-focused. Patient of course, it's it's not it's not an easy part, eh? because I think indeed uh, research foundations like yours are 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 quite uh, unique. And as I explained during my talk, uh, in the end, I think uh, uh, research foundations should work much closer with uh, public money, with the tax money. And, and there we should find much more of a connection because some foundations, foundations tend to be against governmental money. But I think you can keep your independence uh, when you collaborate with, uh, with governmental institutions um, if you do it on the right conditions. So that for me is, might also be uh, a possibility, but okay, just uh, want to, to get those ideas on the table and uh, it's not an uh, easy solution, I know, but yeah, collaboration, unfortunately, <laughs> that's where you have to go, I think. Well, I, I can just say something about IMI, if you want. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, that's, oh, sorry, John, to interrupt. I've, <laughs> I also want to say something about IMI, but please go first. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I mean, I, I thought you, you'd finished. Did I interrupt you? No, 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 go ahead. I forgot about okay. it, but uh, go. <laughs> so I, I understand, Cynthia, how, you know, you could have some conflict in these programs, but um, I, I think not just within IMI, but within your programs generally, um, I, I wondered if you were able to kind of separate um, what your goals were uh, compared to those goals of, of, of industry. Because um, 
I think in the IMI project that, that I was involved with, we were very clear that it was pre-competitive. Uh, and that, that, that word had to be debated a lot. And in actual fact, it was debated by me bringing all of the lawyers from the companies and from the universities in one room in Brussels and writing an agreement that gave us the freedom to do all the things that you wanted to do. So I, I think it, it was a question of um, bringing all the parties together and, and making quite clear that we had an agreement to begin with, which you must be doing when you're working with companies doing clinical trials or preclinical work or whatever. And I think what we were able to do was to show that what the academics did and what the industry did was rather different. And so there was no competition. We had a, a shared interest. Uh, and that was defined uh, by the legal agreement. I have to say that the legal agreement um, by lunchtime uh, was not going to happen. It, it was a bit like Brexit. Um, you know, I called a very early lunch break um, so that, you know, people could actually calm down a little bit. And then um, I think a number of us, the academics, pointed out to um, a number of the lawyers that actually we were talking about cancer. Uh, and we were talking about people who were dying from this disease and that we had to come to an agreement, a compromise, uh, because we were dealing with a very important health issue. And I think some of the lawyers involved in all of you know, many of these contracts that you must be dealing with at the Marion Agri just forget what the hell we're supposed to be doing here and what the point of it is. I think the problem starts if the academics are trying to replicate what the industry is doing, you know, to discover drugs um, and, and whether they pattern them or not. So I think separate, I wanted to ask you really, you know, do you think there's a, a proper separation between the goals of what you're doing in the health area and what, what the industry might be doing? Are they separated enough? Because I think drug, I, I'm, I'm very skeptical about uh, drug discovery in, in academic institutes. I think that, that's the job of industry. I think academics have a, an, another purpose. Well, I think our perspective and our aims are quite different and separate. And so uh, when we collaborate with, in that case, for example, the pharmaceutical industry, we of course um, define some uh, uh, specific agreements. And I remember the person mainly involved in that kind of, uh, let's say, dialogue with the private uh, partner. And it was not so easy because it, he was not so used to deal with some issues related to legal aspects. And so he have also to, 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 to apply some skill in that. So it is also a question of unbalance in terms of this kind of uh, expertise. And uh, so I think it, it is not so, it is an issue. And as you said, we, we, have, we have to be very clear that we have different aims. And I think the Institute is quite uh, uh, good at doing this, but it is not uh, taken for granted. So you're right, we have not to, to, to uh, our main aim is not to do new, new discoveries. But uh, if you have uh, some findings uh, or discovery, we have to also to consider this, uh, this kind of um, uh, result. And we decided not to pattern it, even if they, 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 they can, even if we do so, some kind of research in that direction. Um, we have a comment from Francois, but just to reflect on these two messages, uh, whatever objectives of the institutions are, uh, about 30% of pharmaceuticals were discovered in academia and sometimes things happen um, against the plan, so to speak, serendipity, and uh, looks like academia diligently patents everything these days to be able to sell it profitably to the industry. And uh, it is still a big business model because chemistry departments are there, no one canceled them. So, and um, 
we, this model still exists and then there's a huge problem once again pro public and private money leaving it just to industry no one will invest into non-profitable diseases non-profitable uh, positions in a disease uh, and that's why we have we see in myeloma what we see in myeloma it's outrageous competition because it's a cash cow and it's not targeting the right places because academia could have done it but let's say you're right it's not academic um, purpose they're not funded for that no one tells them you're in academia we're missing this particular issue why don't you go and find it so that's not not how life works but that's just an observation uh, i'd like to give a word to francois and then maybe Lydia can comment on her experience with imi because this whole idea of collaboration competition is extremely important and then anyone else who wants to come in francois uh, thank you <clears throat> um, I, I just wanted to uh, to comment on the uh, I have been very lucky to, uh, to work a lot with uh, Silvio Garattini. Um, I think the contribution of, of uh, Professor Garattini for the regulation of medicines in, uh, in Europe has been massive. I mean, he, uh, he has been a long-lasting member of the CPMP. He was uh, a founding member of the URTC, if I can remember. And um, also, thanks to Silvio Garattini, when the agency was uh, was um, uh, uh, below the umbrella of uh, uh, the DG industry uh, for the European Commission, the, the agency went uh, under the umbrella of the DG Sanko uh, after he, he, uh, he, uh, he, he intervened in favor of this uh, of this uh, conflict of interest. But the point, Cynthia, that I wanted to make is probably uh, 15 years <clears throat> after the work of uh, Professor Garattini at the European level in the field of regulation. Uh, and we can see, because I was also involved in the IMI project, that there is a lot of conflict of interest uh, between the regulators and, and the industry. And when I say conflict of interest, it's not necessarily financial conflict of interest. There is a lot of intellectual conflict of interest, which is even probably even stronger than, uh, than, uh, than the financial conflict of interest. On, on, I also believe that IMI creates an intellectual conflict of interest which allows industry uh, to, to, uh, to, in a way, to, uh, to manipulate, in fact, the, the drug regulation in Europe. So my, my point, my question, Cynthia, is how, how, do you perceive, how do you perceive, in fact, this... Uh, this uh, massive conflict of interest between industry and regulators in Europe. Does that explain, in fact, the low standard of uh, low standards of authorization of uh, medicines uh, in Europe? I'm taking the example of anti-cancer medicines. Uh, do you have any, uh, any views on that? And do you feel that, unfortunately, 15 years after all, the campaign made by Silvio Garattini, we we, we can just, uh, we, unfortunately, we can just say that these conflict of interest are very, very uh, present and very effective. Well, I agree with you that conflict of interest are present uh, at the level of regulatory agency with pharmaceutical industry and Silvio Garattini always uh, fight to make the regulatory agency more transparent and more independent from drug industry. Um, I, I, I don't know if a situation uh, has changed and become uh, a little um, better now, but I think that, uh, for example, there are some more other <laughs> questions with, uh, and, and some other things that we can ask to regulatory agency. Another point that Silvio Garattini just made because uh, we mentioned him uh, requires to um, ask the regulatory agency to evaluate uh, drugs according to the added therapeutic value. And uh, so I think there are some open points that we can uh, go through and ask and fight for them. It is not easy. And I think that, uh, of course, the relationship, uh, relationship with pharmaceutical industry are, are present. Um, one thing that just made me smile is that Silvio Garattini, it is, uh, in, in, in his uh, 19s, is more optimistic than me. 
on, on these issues and also on other issues. So he continued trying to ask and fight. And so uh, we have to go on maybe. <laughs> and so, but uh, I think that the situation is, is still critical from the point of view. Thank you. Lydia, would you like to say something or we can go to Jack, you had your hand up or? Yeah, maybe just a, a little con comment on our experience with uh, with IMI. Uh, they had a call on uh, on drug repurposing, uh, and so we we looked into it because uh, yeah, that's you know <laughs> one of the things we're interested in. But then what we've seen is that indeed, I think IMI is really driven by the companies because we wanted to, to put in our IDs, our, the drugs we had in mind, and the indications we had in mind. But the goal they had was actually fully determined by some companies who had drugs and who asked the academics to investigate uh, those drugs in the indications they selected. So, of course, that I was not with what we had in mind uh, about about the call, but in this kind of setup, my feeling is that uh, sometimes this is really uh, public money that goes to IMI is is used to do the research to have the research done by academics on the request of the pharma industry. And I don't see what goes really in return, like in that, in that call to the public. Of course, in the end, of course, then if results come out, the companies will develop it further. So I don't see any, except for the publications, of course, any benefit that will go to the, to the public at large. Maybe, I don't know, John, if you can comment on that. I know you're not a believer of drug repurposing, but let's put that aside <laughs> and just on the, on the, on the whole, on the concept uh, as such, where I sometimes feel in those IMI projects that it's really using the academic environment to perform the research uh, really at, as a service for the companies. Well, I mean, I, I said that um, we insisted uh, that it should be pre-competitive. Uh, and I, I'm surprised that even IMI uh, let the, the people in industry uh, demand what you wanted to, um, what they wanted to have screened. I mean, that, that's contract research. Yeah, that's, that's how I perceived it when I learned that, about that. That, that's, exactly. that, that's, that's not an, an, an innovative medicines initiative. Uh, and so there's a problem of direction. So I, th I think as, a, as an idea for pre-competitive research, it's good. And, and I think that Mario Negri coming back to the Institute, by the way, I did a sabbatical in Mario Negri a long time ago with uh, Maurizio Dincalci. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and I knew Silvia Marsoni. We were good yes, friends. You know, yeah. so I know, you know, from that time. Um, but I, I think um, that, I mean, Lisa's right, 30% of drugs might come from, um, from, I don't know recently, but uh, in the past may have come from academia. But I think academia has a role to do more pre-competitive research. And, and then it, it, with a patent or not, um, you know, it can license those ideas out. Um, the problem, and Jack knows more about this than me, is that the ideas aren't very patentable. You've got to have substance. Um, but, you know, if you look at the main anti-cancer drugs, uh, rituximab, I think that came from a biotech, um, Gleevec, that's industrial, um, you know, the ones that really made an impact. Uh, what, you know, all the anti-PD1s, all the checkpoint inhibitors all come from academics. No. The, the, the findings did. The, 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 no, the, the, that's not quite true. There was a company that was bought by Bristol Myers that talked oh, to no. James. 
Um, you know, so James Allison di didn't develop them at all. I can't remember the name of the company, Jack Mayer. Ono, Ono. The Japanese company is oh, called you know, Ono. Therapeutics. Mm. No, but CTLA, CTLA4, for example. Ah, Epidemia. Yeah. Myers bought. Mm. Um, you know, so they were spun into biotex. And so, you know, may, maybe the model for, for, um, for Mario Negri is, is to spin stuff into biotex, you know, to have a, 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 a you know, a, a biotech farm uh, close to the Institute, uh, an incubator. That's the word I wanted. John, you know, but then to, you have what, goes, what happened, what was mentioned last time with uh, Geneton, the company that was at the basis did all the research work for the Zorgensma and then licensed it to a biotech, Avexis, and then that was bought by Novartis. And we, we end up with a two million drug for something where indeed the research was done with, by Geneton with uh, all the money from from the TV and, and things like that. So I'm not sure that the biotech, uh, that's what most academics now do, eh? they spin out in biotech and, and, they, and yeah, they're happy if they have revenues from that, but that doesn't really solve the health pro uh, process. Eh? The unmet needs are not served by the biotechs. Eh? There is a big increase now in terms of drugs coming from biotechs, but the question is at which point they get stuff from industry. And by the way, comment on Gleevec, it's a joint from academia and industry with Oregon Health. So it was not purely industry. So, um, Ian, fantastic, you raised your hand. I'd like to introduce you. Thank you, first of all, for joining our seminars. And uh, you are the one who is the res resulted in the seminar because I think I learned about the good pharma book in your office at Oxford. <laughs> and then I emailed Silvio and then I went to see uh, Mario Negri. So thank you so much. It's um, amazing to see you. Uh, you're muted right now. So if you could unmute yourself, we can hear your comments or questions. Thank you, Elisabetta. Um, I'm very glad that I introduced you to the Mario Negri Institute. It's, as you know, that I feel uh, a really great institute and it's lovely to have listened to Chinzia's um, uh, presentation. I, I arrived a little bit late, so I was uh, very sorry to be about five, seven minutes late in, so excuse that. Uh, d does everyone, in fact, on, on the uh, call know about the Good Pharma book? Yep, I read it. <laughs> yes, because uh, it's a very important book, actually. When uh, Lydia said just now, research foundations like yours are unique, she made a very important point. There's very little, little evidence anywhere in the world of a foundation quite like this. And um, I respect it for all sorts of reasons. One, one of them not being, um, not taking out patents and uh, enjoying the freedom that that uh, um, results in. L listening to the conversation that's been just now, um, I'm impressed by the distortions of research agendas which can result from industry dominance. Uh, so for example, if you were embarking on a way of trying to control, uh, to treat um, COVID-19, would you, on the base of, basis of past records, choose to look at an antiviral drug is the track record of antiviral drugs which have been introduced sufficient to, to actually bet on that particular horse? In fact, can any of you think of any viral diseases that are actually influenced by antiviral drugs? Epsi, Epsi. 
The Pepsi. only one I can think of is Herbie Zoster. Pepsi. Uh, uh, yeah, but, but exactly, it, it's um, not. Well, no, I mean, there's Hep C, HIV has been a remarkable HIV is a success. Okay, thank you for I mean, that. Was, that was, that was fate, rapidly fatal 20, uh, 25, 30 years ago. And now uh, men with HIV who are treated have a longer life expectancy than um, men who don't have HIV, funnily enough. Well, thank you very much for pointing out the fact that I was overlooking that. Hep C as well, I think we mentioned. Hep C, Hep -C as well. So um, one of the things that I guess living in Oxford I'm aware of is that in terms of treating COVID-19, we at least have some evidence, it's not an antiviral, that dexamethasone mm -hmm. is uh, a useful agent for some classes of patients. Um, there's no um, financial interest in pushing for a tr uh, uh, an examination of the, the worth of dexamethasone. Um, so I think it is very important actually to be able to have um, a testing um, atmosphere where one can look at um, prospects that aren't going to make any money because there may be things like dexamethasone, for example, in, in COVID-19 that turn out to be useful. And I think getting that balance correct, I mean, one of the things that, do you remember the um, two people who were working at Amgen? They um, wrote something, it was a paper in Nature, I think, where they looked at the track record of um, uh, possible candidates for development. Uh, and they found a very disappointing um, mm. replication uh, rate. I forget the name of the two authors, but it was a really a, quite an important paper. And I think that the, the incentive uh, to, and it, it in fact it implied that the, 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 the quality of some preclinical research in academia particularly was bad, and that it wasn't surprising that they were um, sometimes led to false leads as a consequence of this not very good research. And it was the incentive to draw attention to that, first of all, and then to improve the quality of uh, preclinical research was because if a drug company is going to make a very large investment in the development of a, a molecule which uh, uh, on the base of preclinical research looks promising, it wants to be certain that the massive investment which that involves um, uh, is going to be uh, well spent. Whereas at the other end of things, um, the control trials, the, 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 the investment has been sunk by that time. By the time it reaches phase three trials, it's other people who have the interest in doing, um, if you like, um, less than good um, clinical trials, perhaps not to publish some trials that uh, should be published to get a balanced view of what the um, body of research on a particular topic has actually shown. So the incentives for improving the quality of research and for in ensuring the publication of well done research, whether it's preclinical or um, um, phase three trials, um, like GC1, which was a landmark um, when it was done, uh, a really important uh, moment in um, treatment testing. Um, those conflicts, uh, which aren't the same as someone having shares in a, um, uh, a product that they're involved in uh, assessing, they're, they're far more, if you like, entrenched in the whole enterprise of uh, medical research. And they're very difficult to know how to deal with. I certainly don't have many um, as a patient now because I'm getting very out of date with what people are finding. So I've already demonstrated my ignorance on a couple of things. Um, I, I'm, as a patient, um, uh, want to see better research because I'm going to depend on it. I um, 
if, if you take, for example, I, I, I think you mentioned myeloma recently, it brings to mind a, um, an article that Alessandro Liberati um, published in, in the, the, the Lancet, where he complained as a patient that people, he knew that there was research, that research had been done which was relevant to the choices he was having to make but it wasn't getting published. Mm -hmm. And he was quite rightly as a patient, furious about it. And he said so in that editorial. These are fundamental problems which are not being addressed by the, the um, scientific community, um, not just scientific, the ethics community as well, actually. They're pretty lousy at um, uh, promoting um, uh, good research and publication. Sorry, I've witted on for too long. Uh, excuse me. Thank you for indulging me as the oldest person in the call. <laughs> Ian, thank you so much. And it actually would be great to have you for the whole hour if you spare one hour for us to give a seminar on all the amazing uh, papers that you've written. I'm but past it. I'm pa I really am. I'm past it. <laughs> just a few comments that you mentioned the Amgen piece of uh, research and uh, once again very important work you're right correct me if I'm wrong but I think they never um, released the data on the candidates and uh, if this is true back to Cynthia's points on transparency is what good did they do to the world where now everyone else needs to recheck those. Well, 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 it, sorry, Jack, I think it is true. Bayer have published a similar paper. So it's not just Amgen. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, it's, 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 it's very common general knowledge in the drug industry. They may not want to embarrass mm -hmm. universities who they have to have relationships with. But, um, you know, the idea that most high, uh, you know, there's a comment which actually didn't come from the drug industry, but is, but it's true, which is just because it's published in nature doesn't mean it's false, oh. right? I think there is a, a no vent, no, or no well-funded venture capital firm or drug company would take at face value academic results unless they could replicate them themselves. That's a very good point. But once again, Jack, if these results are not made public and I completely understand the embarrassment yeah. part, but think about it, all this research, no one recalled those papers. Some companies, some biotechs yeah. will be spending billions. And, and if, anyone is, if anyone is interested in, in some of the worst areas, I've got a collection of them, which I'm happy to share. St uh, ischemic stroke was particularly bad. Hundreds and hundreds of papers published on positive results, none of which worked in the clinic. Uh, ALS, uh, motor neuron disease, another example, dozens and dozens of academic papers published with things working in rats and mice, nothing worked in the clinic. And most of it didn't work in rats and mice when the, when the studies were done properly. So it's a, it's a common problem. Mm -hmm. And again, so again you, massive lack you of... Sent Vinnie Prasad, you sent me Vinnie Prasad's paper just recently. Yeah. Um, you know, showing the very small proportion of academic findings a claim to then be clinically potentially useful uh, that actually arrive in the clinic. That's not just that's not a problem with with uh, falsification. I mean, the Glenn, it's Glenn Begley was that's it. yeah that's Begley it. yeah very good paper yeah and and, um, and um, James Begley and Alice yeah, Begley and Alice, yeah. Uh, but the first paper was actually from Bayer uh, from Thomas Schlenger who was in our IMI project. So I know Thomas pretty well. And, and he actually um, noted, I think, which areas uh, they'd found the problems in, uh, in that paper. If you go back to it, it's in Nature Reviews and Drug Discovery. Uh, I don't think they could be more transparent than that. Um, I'm not saying that it was transparent. I'm saying I don't think it was possibly ethically right to highlight particular papers. I don't know. That's the debate. I'm going to have to go, I'm afraid. Interesting. Well, <laughs> Lily, your comment now. <laughs> yes, uh, I agree with what has been said because we have the same thing that we try to reproduce data from academics before starting the clinical research, but uh, couldn't succeed. So I, I really think there's an, there's an issue there. And I thought it was also Ioannidis who, who kind of published on that. But okay, what I, I wanted to come back to the example of, of dexamethasone. Uh, that was given, and I think it's a really good example of of uh, demonstrating what is possible. Because the good res the really good results for COVID came from uh, the recovery trial, 
which is clinical research that was really fully supported by collaboration between the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Oxford was in there, I think Welcome also. So it's really a collaboration and uh, some national UK uh, institution. So that's my point. If you really collaborate, you can do the right clinical research. But then, of course, uh, as was mentioned also, you have the difficulty with the regulator, how the regulator will not be interested in looking at those data. And that's the problem we still have today. But for dexamethasone, we had a webinar on drug repurposing and we asked a question to Hans-Georg Eichler from IMA about dexamethasone very precisely, what they're going to do about it. And then he said, yeah, we're going to come with a solution. And two months later, they had a, some kind of a shortcut solution that they looked at the data and they give uh, scientific advice under Article 5.3 whatever, that, that's a certain article. So if they really want, they can do that. And now the European Commission has extended the mandate of EMA, but only for emergency cases where they clearly asked EMA to look at clinical results for treatments, not on request of the industry. So I think things are moving but we have to push harder also with the regulator that they should be willing to deal with third parties and not only with the market authorization holders. That's what I think, but yeah, we have to push. <laughs> Thank you, lady. Um, can I ask, I mean, in some ways, we've touched on the publication problems and I think that is, is, is definitely an issue because I'll be covering that again when I do that repeat uh, talk on perils of peer review but it strikes me that even when an institute is as unique and rare um, as the one that we've heard about today which is potentially independent it's transparent it has no patents it's got all these aspirational and noteworthy um, you know uh, sort of positives to it but two questions I would ask is one, from the data that the Institute has, where it has abided by all of those great principles, can it show examples of how that has actually helped improve outcomes for patients so that it gives more of an example set, you know, an example setting motivation for others to also embrace those qualities and, and core values. And if in instances where it couldn't achieve that, presumably it's because it, as soon as it underwent a sort of collaborative approach, you're kind of back to the conflict of interest sort of catch 22 scenario. So I just wanted to get a sense from both the speaker and, and other people here, whether that is what we're up against, or is it that we haven't had long enough to test the true sort of altruistic uh, core components of this to enough of an extent to show that actually, if you are transparent, if you don't have patents, if you don't have as much conflict of interest, not just financial, but sort of how you're liaising with other organizations so that the right questions are asked clinically that don't sort of um, impede on, uh, you know, sort of conflict of interest that are to do with getting good results. If that can be shown indeed to actually better you know, research for everyone and to improve on how trial publications work, then, then in a sense that can be used as a advert or a, a sort of a, you know, uh, aspiration call for others to follow suit. Well, I'm just thinking about two examples. The one is the one mentioned by Ian Chalmers, uh, and there was the, um, an historic example uh, done uh, coordinated by the Marine Green Institute, which is the GC trial in the cardiological field. And so with this um, multi-center trial involving hospital and cardiologists in Italy, uh, it was um, found uh, that uh, 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 thrombolytic um, therapy can reduce the mortality of myocardial infarction. 
So this was one example, and it is an historical example. There are many others, of course, but uh, I think that that kind of uh, perspective on research, so as I said, a search nested in clinical practice with the collaboration of a network of clinicians, and done in this way can bring to, to uh, benef some, some findings that are benefit uh, for patients. This is an example. Another thing that uh, comes to my mind is the, the focus on rare diseases, for example. So we have fields, a research area when, that deal with uh, uh, rare diseases, which, has, which are not so often covered by research uh, funded or done by pharmaceutical industry. So in a sense, I think that this kind of model responds to the uh, also mm, applying this model to a research question relevant for clinician and patient, uh, and also dealing with the fields and aims that are not the same of uh, um, any research institute that has uh, another kind of perspective, private perspective, or another kind of perspective. So uh, these are some examples. Of course, it's not so easy to, to, to test this model. <laughs> So I can say that. It, uh, just to add something, it's, it's um, worth pointing out that over 90% of the cardiology units in Italy participated in GC. Uh, it's an extraordinarily high proportion of the um, concerned clinical community to be involved in a multi-center trial. And in that respect, it was special as well. Yeah, if I can add something, I'm Rita Banzi, also from the Mario Negri Institute. I'm one of the colleagues uh, to whom Cinzia loves to discuss about how we can put this uh, uh, Mario Negri model into uh, the next century somehow, because we really need to understand why and how we can uh, continue on this model and not to be tempted by different models that are around us and are like sirens asking us to go and work for them rather than, rather than for the Mario Negri Institute. Um, my, my very short comment is, um, um, is uh, about the, the question by Lisa. It, it's not easy to uh, provide um, clear examples on how the Mario Negri Institute research has impacted into the well-being of Italians and Europeans and maybe uh, people around the world, because as you know, research is so uh, interconnected and, and we cannot say that we save lives because we proved that streptokinase was good for people with myocardial infarction by, the, by our study, only by our study. But what we can, I think, uh, stress and what we can prove, and Cinzia in that respect is writing a book about the people that were trained or worked for many years at the Mario Negri Institute and then went working in different health institutions, academias around Italy mainly, but also abroad. This is, I think, something that it's difficult to, to, to measure, but it's a great impact uh, and it's very important for uh, spreading the ideas that uh, were, um, let's say, developed uh, in the younger year uh, at the Mario Negri Institute and then were, let's say, uh, made grown uh, in, in other institutions. And I think this is, uh, is something difficult to, to measure, but uh, equally important than measuring the, the length of, uh, uh, of uh, survival in people with myocardial infarction. So, um, I, 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 thanks to, I, I would like to thank uh, Ian to mention uh, Alessandro Liberati, who was really one of uh, the, the gold researchers at the Mario Negri Institute. Uh, he was the founder of the Italian Cochrane Center many years ago. And we were lucky, Chins and I, we were very lucky to work with him uh, for a while. And he was very, very, very focused on uh, trying to find reliable ways to measure the impact of research. And this is something I think we need to uh, take uh, always in consideration. And we do have very unreliable indicators and uh, metrics for measuring research. 
and we need to find uh, other uh, systems to, to really reward the, the, the research that is good for, for the public and for, for the health system rather than for medical journals, for instance. Peter, the, the point that you make uh, makes me think that um, Silvio Garattini was a bit like uh, St. Ignatius, Ignatius uh, Loyola sending out um, Jesuits to different corners of the world <laughs> to take the message of the Mario Negri Institute. <laughs> well, some of them were not really sent to other institutions. They, they, they went. They, yeah. they, they <laughs> went because, you know, the Mario Negri Institute has uh, some financial issues. But anyway, <laughs> this is uh, more or less what uh, happened. And I think the book that Cinzia is writing is really something that will serve uh, to, 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 to put the, the Mario Negri Institute initiative into a broader context in terms of uh, dissemination and training and, and promoting of good values. I hope it's in English. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. We mean Italian, but we could think about translating it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Cynthia, we'll have to have you back now. We'll learn Italian by that time. So you <laughs> present the book. Uh, we, learn, we learn Italian. 